Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the full card of fights for UFC 259, Blahovitz versus Adesanya. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the card and our first fight on the prelims. So in our first fight, we have in the Bantamweight division, Mario Batista versus Trevin Jones. So um, this is a pretty good matchup right here. Trevin Jones came in the UFC and almost got um, put out of there by Tamir Valiev early, and it was able to rally and catch him and put him out. And also, he got did score a takedown. So this is an interesting matchup. Trevin Jones, not the cleanest of strikers, but he has a good, good frame. And also, he has some real solid BJJ. Taking the offense isn't super phenomenal, but definitely something to look out for and worry about. Especially with Batista, we haven't really seen his grappling super addressed yet. We seen him get submitted by Sandhagen some years ago. Then we saw him in like his most recent performance against Miles Johns. Like he was really deal with a real solid wrestler, Miles Johns, and take advantage of him. But now you're going with like a different frame, like a longer fighter, not a short fighter that's you know more easier to knee and keep at distance. But how I've seen this one, I see um I think Batista's the more rounded out fighter. I don't think Jones is as crispy with his striking as he needs to be in this one. And I don't think his takedown offense or setup is as clean as it needs to be. And I think Batista, for the most part, has addressed that game and that hole in his game or that weaker area in his game. I think he should be able to address the grappling of Jones, defend the takedowns, and be able to get back to his feet if needed. You know, feet, I think he's a much cleaner striker. I think he's sharper. His setups are better. Maintain that distance and stick the jab on Jones and make it hard for him to get to that position where he can get it to the ground and, you know, take it to where he has the advantage. But I do think it's a competitive fight, but I think Batista's able to address the wrestling of Jones, maybe make him, force him to get in the clinch, then spin off the cage, and then start, push off and just, like, keep like, sticking him with the jab, sticking with the teeth, and keep him at bay, and um, beat him to a decision. So in this one, I have Mario Batista via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the lightweight division, Uros Medich versus Alan Cruz. So in this one, you got two long guys, and I think Alan Cruz, he really isn't the most technical striker or the tech, most technical grappler. I think he might have a small grappling edge, maybe, if anything. But outside that, Oroz Medici has been striking on a much higher level for much longer. And Cruz's striking defense is almost not really non-existent. And a lot of stuff he gets away with is because he's tall. Even being tall, he still gets hit with way too many shots he's not that shouldn't be getting hit with. So this one, I think he's really going to be open. That, that frame is going to be used against him, where it usually would be a... Um, a benefit to him, I think, will be a disadvantage against a guy that's just as long as him in Oro Medich and a much more technical striker. And I think overall, is a much better fighter, in my opinion. I think he'll chew up those legs, chew up those, chew up the body with that long frame. The body's gonna be open all day, and Oro Medich's gonna be able to rip him to the body with kicks, spinning back kicks. And then up top, I said Cruz don't really move his head that much, and now at distance, he really at, at, when he's fighting shorter fights, he can get away with. He's going to be getting tagged anymore. So he's going to really going to be open all day. And I don't think he gets chewed up in this one. Chewed up to the leg, chewed up to the body. And then once he gets hand, drop his hand, gets, gets caught up top, dropped, and finished in that second round. So in this one, I have Uros Medich via second round TKL. Now to our next fight we have in the welterweight division, Sean Brady versus Jake Matthews. So I'm um, looking at this one, Brady versus Matthews. And this one is really cut and dry. I just think Brady is better in every area than Matthews. Matthews has some long, like his striking gets sloppy at times, especially when he's going against a, a cleaner striker. He starts to just lunge and old loopy shots and swing for the fences. Whereas Brady stays crisp. Brady might not always be the most amazing, like wow you type striker or type fighter, but he always keeps it clean. That's one thing that's real good about him. And the fundamentals, especially at this level, and really at all levels, but even especially at this level, it really separates you from the pack. And I think that's gonna be different. I think his grappling at a much higher level. Bigger, stronger, better pacing, and more technical in every area. So that's why I think kind of really just big brother in schools, Matthews and one. Picks him apart him picks him apart with a jab, stays technical, makes him miss, take advantage of his aggression, takes him down, controls him on the ground, drops him ground and pound. He might even get a submission, but I think it's gonna be a decision in this one. I think he just like really just neutralizes everything Matthews is doing and exploits his aggression, exploits his his um sloppiness for takedowns. For counter shots and it stays consistent behind his jab and his setups and beats Matthews to a clean decision. So in this one, I got Sean Brady via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the light heavyweight division, Kennedy Nchuku versus Carlos Uberg. So looking at this one, Nchuku versus Uberg. Well, look at Nchuku, he really just a striker. And he's really not even the cleanest of striker. He just really exploits his height and reach. And has still has a whole rack of flaws on the feet. 
on the ground and everywhere in his game. Well, like I said, he's like 6'5 with an 82 or 83 inch reach. So basically the same reach as John Jones and one inch taller than John Jones. So that guy has a lot of height. He has a good frame. He could build on that frame. I mean, build on that frame with, you know, and ask more skills to that and sharpen his skills. And he'd be a very dangerous fighter. But right now, it's like, this is not going to be the best for him. Like he's going to get another long fight in Carlos Uberg, who has a, an experienced kickboxer at a very high level, a championship level kickboxer, a champion kickboxer. And with those long, long arms and the way he overextends, even though he's that long, it takes you more time to get back to your stance. He doesn't know how to really just throw his shots and throw at the end of his punches and end of his kicks. So he overextends and that just makes him even more open. So against a guy like Uber, who has real good counter striking, real good offensive striking, a real good eye, good footwork, he's going to be able to make Nchukwu overextend even more, be set him, walk him into counters and put him out. And I think he does that within the first. So allow Nchukwu to mess it. You could strike him wrong, overextend himself. He already been that long and not have that window of time like with a guy with a shorter arm so just be able to pull back or really be wide open chin wide open get caught with a check hook drop and finish with some ground and pound in that first round so in this one i have carlos uberg via first round tkl now to our next fight we have in the flyweight division tim elliott versus jordan espinosa and i see this one espinosa to me he's like a solid fighter but i definitely think he relies too much on being fast and explosive he, he um covers all of his holes with his athleticism. Like his defense, a lot of times he moves straight back and just be leaning that head back, but he's so fast that he can move his feet and just be out of range. So leaning back, I mean, like it's okay to lean back at sometimes. We understand the range, but it's like just straight up, just going backwards and leaning backward. Like you got to step off the angle or you just know you're right at the tip at the end of the, like, you know, your striking range. It's like he just really be guesstimating out there and just backing up. Both feet backpedaling like next to each other square. Like, yeah, that's that's what's bad. When you backpedaling, like you're just literally just square as you could be, backing up and like head straight up and then leaning back. Like he'd be doing that a lot of times. He likes backpedaling straight up at times, especially when the pressure cardio can be questionable at times. But again, like I said, everything with him is about like it's covered with speed and explosion. Not against a guy like Tim Elliott. Even though Tim Elliott can be wild and unorthodox at times, that could pay work against him. I think his aggression is going to be a big factor in this one. His wrestling, his size is going to be a big factor in this one. His experience in this one. His jiu is going to be a big factor in this one. I think he's really going to be aggressive against Espinosa. Espinosa is going to be winning early just because of, of his speed advantage and being able to be stick and move. But eventually, Elliot's aggression and pressure is going to start to break him down. He's going to start to score more takedowns, start to get more control on him, go for submissions, work for some ground and pound. And really wear down Espinosa and then really take control in third round. So winning the second and third round and getting the decision over Espinosa. So in this one, I have Tim Elliott via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the women's strawweight division, L Livia Renata Souza. So I see something with Lavinia. I see something with Livia. So whatever your name is, Livia Renata Souza versus Amanda Limos. So um, I see this one right here. I was asking on two high-level black belts or two high-level grapplers. But what do you lean? Um, Souza's actually four years younger than Limos, so it's, Souza does have a youth advantage. Limos has a size and reach advantage, and I think she has a striking advantage. I think Souza has a grappling advantage as far as MMA-wise. Well, really, all overall, I'll say she's probably the better grappler in my opinion, but I think that's where edge where Souza could potentially win, especially a lot of times we go against these grapplers, like whoever the grappler that can control the takedown, you know, control the takedown, basically, who can get it to the ground, can neutralize the other grappler because they're both high level, so they know everything they're doing. And, you know, this win basically by being on top and landing some ground and pal. So I do worry about that concern as far as Souza. But looking at Amanda Limbo, she does have the much cleaner striking. I'm going to say it's like it's cleaner, but it's not like she's so much better. But the fact that she's going to throw more than one strike and she's not telegraphing her strikes. Like she's not telegraphing her kicks. She's not telegraphing trying to land an overhand. She's going to be throwing volume and setting her strikes and throwing like maybe two to four strikes instead of Souza who's literally doing like one or at most two at, at a time, but most is going to be just one strike at a time. Limo's going to be out volume or out working and using that height, using that reach, using that size. But so is the best chance, I think, to mix it up and get some takedowns and control her, which is a concern. But outside of that, even look at Sosa's stats, I think the most takedowns she scored in the fight was three, three, and that was in a losing effort. So I don't expect her to come with a high takedown um, strategy in this one. 
I expect her to um be typical, and I think that's going to cause her to lose. But smart, her smart um, game plan should be to enforce a takedown more, but I don't think she's going to be smart in this one. I think it's going to be a case where she might do one takedown, have success with it, and then go away from it. Then Limos is going to I'll work on the feet and beat her to a decision. So in this one, I have Amanda Limos via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the flyweight division, Rogario Bontarin versus Kai Car France. So um, looking at this one, you got um two solid guys right here. You got a grappler in Bontarin, who's definitely the more well-rounded fighter because he has definitely shown a good account for him on the feet. And on the ground, Kai Car France, he has shown a good account on the ground as well, but it's not like he has shown a good finishing ability on the ground. He's like, could mix some takedowns, has some good control, definitely some phenomenal takedown defense. And all, and also definitely the better striker, like a real clean striker. But really look at this one, um, Kaikar France takedown defense is like around 80 or 90%, so real high. So I think he can stop the takedowns of Bonnerin. And also if he does get taken down, he is good at getting back to his feet. I think he's just a much faster, much more powerful, much more technical striker on the feet. And should be able to um, outstrike Bonnerin, I think relatively easily. Well, I wouldn't say super easily, but clean. It shouldn't be like no controversy or super close. It should be clean that um, Kaikar France is the more technical striker, landing the cleaner strikes and controlling the striking battle in this one and controlling the whole pace of this fight in general. And I see him beating um, Bonnerin via decision. So in this one, I have Kai Car France via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the flyweight division, Joseph Benavidez versus Askar Askarov. So a long time staple of the smaller weight division. Like remember, I mean, I said remember, but at once at Bantamweight and now for a long time at flyweight. So Benavidez versus Askar Askarov. Another thing, Benavidez has really never lost a fight that wasn't a title fight. Outside of that, Sergio Pettis fight. But outside of that, it's been losses to Dominic Cruz when he was at the top, losses to Mighty Mouse when he was at the top, and now lo losses to um, Figueroa when he, he when he is at the top now. So hasn't really lost to too many people. I mean, only lost one fight that he probably should, still should have won that wasn't a title fight. So Benavidez versus Askar Askarov. How see this one? I think Askar Askarov's um, striking could definitely be an issue. He's definitely a clean striker. He definitely got some length and some lankiness to him. So that could definitely be an issue for Benavidez. Wrestling. I feel like a lot of people might try to say, oh, he's getting older or he's demoralized or this and that. But I don't think at really any point, I think Benavidez is always going to have good scramble ability, always going to have good wrestling defense and pretty good wrestling offense. But I think the best thing about Benavidez wrestling-wise is his defense and his scramble ability. Like his offense is solid, but it's definitely his defense and scramble ability. And I think against a guy like Askar Askarov who loves to go for these takedowns and also Askar Askarov not really having a lot of power. I think Benavidez is going to be able to address a lot of what Askar Askarov brings to the game. And be able to uh, definitely neutralize or really shut down a lot of his grappling in this one. Or his takedown attempts. And maybe even reverse the moment. I know Askar Askarov definitely gives up his back way too much. Way too much. And that could cause Benavidez. You know, Benavidez has some underrated jiu-jitsu as well. I'm not saying he's going to submit him. But I definitely think he can take advantage and, and gain positional control over Askar, Askar Askarov. Especially with a lot of these flashy, aggressive takedowns Askar Askarov likes to go for. So I feel like, really I'm saying basically Benavidez should get the better of the grappling or should be able to shut down a lot of what Askar Askarov brings in the grappling aspect and keep this fight on the feet. Like Askar Askarov, I think a little more cleaner with his striking, but Benavidez striking might not be the cleanest on paper, but he very effective with the striking he has. So I feel like he can duck under, get into the, the mid range or get into the inside the fight, land a bunch of body shots and come up top and touch Askar Askarov on the chin and really just be aggressive being on the inside and, when Askar Askar tries to go for takedown, scramble, maybe even get some reversals, then go back and keep getting on the inside and landing these heavy shots on Askar Askar off and give him a hard, tough night. And Benavides has been in there with some real solid grapplers, and every single time he's put on a great performance, like literally every single time. I don't think he really has had, lost a person who just you would classify as a grappler. And I feel like Askar Askar is a full world on a fighter, but I definitely think the most dangerous thing about him is his grappling. Like you saw when his grappling was, he was able to, uh, you know, have as much success with his grappling against, say, um, Moreno, it was a close fight that he really should have lost, but or not to overstand it too long. Basically, I think Benavides can address the grappling, and I think his inside game and his power and his pace is going to allow him to edge Askar Askarov in the decision. So in this one, I have Joseph Benavides via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in our cold prelim headliner in the bantamweight division, Song Yadong versus Kyler Phillips. So um, I see this one right here. Grappling, Phillips, striking, Yadong Song, experience Yadong Song, or Song Yadong. So um, I heard somebody say that um, Phillips is this and Phillips is that, but how you going to say somebody's durable when they really haven't even really been in a fight and really haven't fought no one? 
That's hard to say. Whereas your dog has definitely been in with some of the better guys in this division. Like he definitely hasn't fought the cream, you know, he hasn't fought the upper echelon just yet, but he's definitely fought some guys that are on their way to that level and have bit down faced some of those guys. So he's whereas Kyler Phillips, he's fought some guys that are entry level UFC caliber fighters. So and he even lost some of them. So um I can't say how good Kyler Phillips is, but I definitely think his juice was better. I definitely think he has a style that can frustrate your dong song. But I think for the most part, Song Yudong takedown offense is solid enough to defend Phillips' takedowns. I do think Phillips has some solid striking as well, but I think Yudong Song definitely has four higher level competition, definitely has the power advantage, and I definitely think he probably could take a better shot when he literally your half your body is your chin. I mean your head, but um thicker, stronger, heavier hands, good takedown offense. I think he should be the neutralized most of Phillips' takedowns and grappling. You know, in his last two fights, his grappling hasn't looked the best defensively takedown defense wise are on the ground but ain't nobody ever been have been able to stop him on, on the ground or really doing anything but i do think phillips is probably the best grappler he's fought as far as submission grappling since he's like since in the ufc but i think based on i think he don't song be able to like i said address the grappling address the takedowns for the most part just like he did in his last two fights he, for the most part being able to address it even though he should have lost both of those fights addressing it for the most part being able to make it a decision landing the heavier shots and keeping the fight relatively close, maybe edging in um, Phillips a little bit by, on a striking d- differential, just a little bit. And then the judges loving Yadong Song, being able to get a decision. But either way, whether it's a, a judge is giving him the decision or him taking it, I think he gets the decision in this one. So in this one, I got Song Yadong via decision. Now to our prelim headliner we have in the Bantamweight division, Dominic Cruz versus Casey Kenny. So um. I don't know why a lot of people are leaning to Kenny. Or they say his kicks are this and his kicks are that. But it's not like he has the ability, like, the ability, like, uh, debilitating kicks. Or he's a guy that's known for having amazing calf kicks or something like that. Or he's this amazing powerful power puncher. Or this amazing fight IQ fighter. Or just such a, a talent. Kenny is a talented fighter. But he's definitely, I would say, a, a world beater. Just yet, or has not shown me to be a world beater. Especially when not when you're getting taken down 20 times by Mirab Divashili. And like 5 to 7 times by Ray Borg. And etc etc like and you're supposed to be a wrestler grappler is you know that's like your base and you're gonna take it out that many times that's like embarrassing really i don't know how you can live with yourself but he able to turn it around and still like say have a great career and not let it um weigh on him too much but again case kidding gives him takedown weighs too much i guess he probably feels like he's so comfortable there or he's so good everywhere that he can give up these takedowns and i get but what divashili is like divashili is just so good at getting around and relentless and ray borg is too but still should not be giving him that many takedowns against anyone, which he did. And it's, and it's like the fact that he's giving those takedowns so easily. I think Dominic Cruz is definitely going to be able to catch him with some of his sneaky takedowns and he scores some takedowns on it. And, and Cruz, a lot of times, don't even really control you too much with those takedowns, but it just adds points, throws you off your game. And I definitely think he's tricky. He's going to be able to catch Kenny with a lot of those takedowns and get some control time. And I think he really can outgrapple Kenny. No ifs and though, but he would, would outgrapple Kenny. Like I said, Kenny thinks he's this, this and that, but he has not shown to be this and that. So I think Cruz could definitely outgrapple him, outstrike him. And let's, like I said, he got some decent kicks, but not no debilitating kicks. So Cruz, especially in a three-round fight, Cruz should be able to stick and move on him all day. The cleaner striker, the more experienced striker, and Kenny has never fought anyone on the levels that Cruz has fought. And Cruz has literally been at the top of the game like his whole career. Returned after hiatus is to come back and fight people on top of career. And we look at the last guy he lost to Cejudo, who's really probably top five or at least top seven all time, pound for pound. And he came at, fought him off for like a three years all via injury and for him in a title fight. It looks still relatively decent. But yeah, but it's different things. Like Kenny has no punching power, not a debilitating kicker or a power puncher by a power kicker or power anything. So it's really going to be technique versus technique and speed. And Cruz can beat him literally in every aspect. Striking, mixed martial arts, grappling. And I think that's what he does. I think he's going to be too elusive, be to tag Kenny up, explore his kicks and take him down off them. And then just go back to picking him apart from the outside. I think he beats Kenny to a decision. I think he lets big brothers him in this one. So in this one, I have Dominic Cruz via decision. Now to our main card. So in our main card, in the first fight on our main card, we have in the light heavyweight division, Tiago Santos versus Alexander Rakic. So I see this one right here. I think um, Santos is explosive. He's very dangerous and definitely can... Change the night for anyone in a split second. But what I really think will happen is one. I think Rack is too big, too young, being like 6'5". He's going to have height advantage, going to have a reach advantage, a size advantage, a very big, light heavyweight. 
about as big of a light heavyweight as you can be. And he has some solid underrated wrestling. So I feel like he can gain some respect on the feet, especially with his kicks to the body, kicks to the leg. And then using that distance and not allowing Santos just to blitz him. And like, and then off the blitz, take Santos down, like counter Santos blitz, give him some distance, get him to react, get him to explode, score takedowns off his reaction, and then control him on the ground, wear him down. Especially after like maybe the first takedown, maybe like in the second, two minutes or three minutes of that first round, start to wear him down. Second round, kind of rinse and repeat. And then probably by that point, Santos start to wear down and be tired and be easier to take down. And I just think from that point, Rackett starts to kick his leg out and then score takedowns and just grind out a decision over Santos. So in this one, I have Alexander Rakic via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the lightweight division, Islam Makachev versus Drew Dober. So um, how I see this one right here. Drew Dober definitely, I would say, give him a strike advantage. He definitely has a lot of power and definitely the streak he is in. He's on and with the steam he's riding, you don't want to be playing around with him too much on the feet. I definitely think Makachev can strike with Dober, but definitely it wouldn't be the smarter route. And Makachev is a smart fighter, especially now. Outside of that one loss, we got knocked out. He now knows like, like what to do to win. It's not all about flash. It's about winning. And he's going to be smart in this one and know to avoid where Do Dober is most dangerous. Like Dober has no real submission threat, no real wrestling threat. He's a striking threat. So if you take him to the ground any, any which way, you're good. He's not going to catch you no guillotine or nothing. Unless you just flat out just give him no respect. But you should be able to take him down any which way and not be concerned. Like some people got amazing guillotines or amazing arm bars, amazing this, amazing that. Drew Dober is not amazing in any submission category. So I feel like um, Makachev has gone more so try to gain the respect of Dober on the feet and just give him just like a, just a little look on the feet that um. I can hold my own with you or there's some stuff you got to watch out on his feet. Maybe flex that overhand and he can do Dober to react to that and start shooting the double off that. And then once he starts getting control on Dober, I just think he starts being relentless in the front point. Even if Dober tries to slow back to his feet, I think Makachev is the best grappler he's ever fought by far. Well, at least best wrestler he's ever fought by far. And it's going to be relentless on Dober, constantly going for takedowns, constantly making Dober have to react to his strikes and then set him takedown. And especially, I think he'll use his kicks a lot to freeze up the power of Dober, whether it be to kick out the, kick out his lead leg so he can't plant as much, or to kick him up top so he can't he has to keep his hands high and to block the kicks and then ducking under scoring takedowns and controlling Dober to a decision. So in this one, I have Islam Makachev via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the bantamweight division for the undisputed bantamweight title, Peter Yan versus Aljamain Sterling. So um, a big fight right here in the Bantamweight division, you got Jan. This is what his first defense against Aljamain Sterling. So, um, how see this one right here is um, like I said, Jan is very dangerous. Sterling is also very dangerous, and just to say the obvious. <laughs> but um, when I got Jan, what I've been seeing is that he's not amazing on his back foot. He's not amazing defensively. He's amazing when you when you start going straight back, or he starts you start allow you know fatigue in front of him, or you allow him to push you back. He's phenomenal. He's dangerous. He's a killer. He's a monster. Almost unstoppable. Almost unbeatable. But going backwards, or when you start striking with him, his striking defense isn't the best. And he often at times dips down. Like his striking defense really is not the most phenomenal. Like he'll have to shell up or just dip down. So he's open for the knee. Like he saw Alda was able to land him. He saw Uriah Faye was able to land him. So he doesn't have the best eyes defensively. He doesn't. So like some people, like they could almost like keep their hands down. They know where strikes come from. Like they could lean back, avoid a kick. They could duck under the right hand. They could slip shots. They can slip left, slip right. They know where the shots come from. Like, you can do a 20-punch combination of them, and they know just the right way to move every single time. Like, it's like, Yan, it's like, this probability-wise, it's like, if I dip down, the most they can do is this, or I'll take least damage statistically just dipping down. Like, it's just, it's like he doesn't really have an eye for the strikes. And I'm pretty sure, I think, if people, more people start looking at that, they're going to realize he doesn't have an eye for defense. His eyes for defense isn't the best. He gets flat-footed a lot of times on defense. And a lot of times he rely on chin. If he had a glass chin, he would be knocked out by Uriah Faber. He would have been knocked out by um, by um, Aldo because he took a literally took a step, dip right down and got hit with a step and knee by Faber, clean and got frustrated. They got hit with that, got buzzed a little bit off of it. And Aldo, I think two times they were catching with a step and knee because, like I said, he just dips down all the time. And even for boxing, that the way he dips down is in the best because they would catch him with an uppercut. It's like some people know how to technically dip, like they dip out of the way of all punches, like just for that slip single instance. And it's like at the exact moment they're throwing the strike, so you're able to dip right under. It's like he just dips down, like regardless if they're going to strike, if the the threat of a strike is there, he dips down. So 
he's really dipping down for uppercuts, stepping knees, head kicks, and everything at that point. But um, yeah, I'm going too long with one. But how I feel this one, I feel like Sterling, like I said, Jan's dangerous. And, and I think also his gra ground game, I think it's a little bit overrated. It's definitely solid. It's definitely better than what his, black, his belt says. But I guess Sterling and the, any active black belt, I think his ground game is not going to look that great as far as offensively. I think Sterling should be able to attack some missions on his back and get some reversals from that position. But I definitely think Jan, you got to respect his grappling offensively and defensively. But to get to this point, I think Sterling, I know Sterling has been able to outstrike all of his opponents. Like literally all of his opponents have... Um, Except Mariah because he got knocked out. But it's literally outside, outside of all his opponents, win and lose, he's been able to outland him. He does a whole rack of volume. And I think he'll be able to keep Yan busy, throwing some takedowns, and just keep busy. And like like I said, Yan really waits for his opponents to slow down, and then he starts to um, or give him an opportunity. I think Sterling just has to be active, not give Yan an opportunity, keep stuff in his face, keep him active, and just stay on orthodox and be himself, mixing takedown attempts, whether he scores them or not. And literally, just the whole fight is just for five rounds, keeping Yan busy. And I think Sterling has the cardio to do that. And he has the pace to do that. And I definitely think he's in position to do that. And I think he will do that. Keep Yan busy. Keep the strikes in his face. Outwork him and beat him to a decision. So in this one, I have Al Jermaine Sterling via decision. Now to our co-main event, we have in the women's featherweight division, Amanda Nunes versus Megan Anderson. So we got the women's champ champ versus Megan Anderson. And how I see this one right here. We see Megan Anderson get... Submitted easily by Felicia Spencer. We saw her make Holly Holm look like a bee. And I'm going against Nunes. I don't think Anderson has really improved anything at all, but she definitely has some power that you got to respect here and there. Sometimes you got to respect everyone's power, but... And she does have a heightened frame on her. That could be an issue, but... I feel like an easy fight, Amanda Nunes, just throw overhand, duck under, scoop her up, take her down, and submit her. And that could be a real easy path to victory for Nunes. So what I just see this one, I think she's going to throw overhand, then switch... Slam her to the body with a kick, duck under, get her legs, pick her up, scoop her, slam her down, land some ground and pound, then tap her out in that first round, probably at around the four minute mark. So in this one, I have Amanda Nunes via fourth round, I mean, I said fourth round, via first round submission. Now to our main event, we have in the light heavyweight division, Jan Blahovitz versus Israel Adesanya. So, um, very big pivotal matchup right here. Blahovitz versus Adesanya. How I see this one right here is um, so um, a lot of people might say size this and size that, but really, unless you're like a real true bully, size isn't as big of a fact. Like say in boxing, like you're a big guy that's gonna really push your size on. Like you gonna have somebody push him against the ropes, lean on him, and throw big heavy body shots, and you're gonna be a big bully out there. But really, a lot of these guys are you gonna have a big authoritative jab. Like you have height, reach, and size on somebody. Like you are gonna keep that jab in their face, keep peppering them up, keep pushing them, sticking the jab in their face. And then knowing, like, when they try to duck down, hit them with big uppercuts to the body or to the chin, mix it up and stuff. Like, let's just, like, some real big bully or anybody, that, like I said, that knows how to do, you know, how to really, because it's not all about, like, when, these size advantages. It's not all about, like, oh, like a video game. Like, when they're, uh, every time you go up and wait, they get another life bar. It's not that. Because you touch anybody on the chin with enough power and, like, it's relative. Like, you, like let's be, like, Godzilla. With this 10 and 20 and 30 pound difference and even 40 pound difference, it's really all relative. Like, if anybody can touch you clean on the chin, you can get knocked out. So it's not a case of you get a whole big, a lot different life bar. It's not. But I'm not even getting into that because it's a whole different thing for another story. And all I'm trying to say is the size as far as who can take more punches it ain't is relevant is people trying to make it seem. And also people say, oh, Adesanya got knocked out and Blackwood's been knocking people out. So that's not very relevant unless Adesanya's open for a shot that Blahovis is a specialist in. Then it really ain't that big of a factor. And also, Black was actually more open, or uh, Blahovitz is actually more open to Adesanya knocking him out than Adesanya is to Blahovitz knocking him out. Because Blahovitz's last loss was to a middleweight, or former middleweight, and Tiago Santos, and it was off a of counter. And Adesanya is a phenomenal counter puncher. It was more recent. It was versus a former middleweight, just like he's fighting now. And he got knocked off, off a counter. And now you're going against a faster, more technical striker. Definitely not as much power, definitely not as explosive, but far more technical. Far slicker, far bigger arsenal. And he can catch you coming in. And Blahovis comes in a lot of times very sloppy and like with these extended flurries. And Adesanya is very good off moving off angles and could definitely catch him. He starts to do that. And definitely has faster footwork and uh, has a lot of stuff to change his angle. So he could definitely throw Blahovis off. It's definitely with the feints. He could get him to draw out those um, flurries even quicker, and which will set him up even more to counter them. Blahovis hasn't really fought up somebody that does feints out there. So it's going to be a whole different thing. Hasn't fought up somebody 
is fast and definitely hasn't beaten someone as fast as Adesanya. And now with the feints, the angles, the switch stance, it's going to really be a frustrating for Blahovitz. But I definitely think the best thing about Blahovitz is the one, or the best chance for him to win is maybe having success with the grappling, but Adesanya has been addressing that. So I feel like Adesanya should be able to address the grappling for the most part. And is like, as much as he needs to win this one. Then, as far as offensive strikes, that left leg can be a factor. Definitely could be a factor. But Adesanya has been in there with some solid kickers. And um, I definitely think with the switch stance, he's going to throw off of Blahovic's kicks. And I think um, Blahovic favors that lead leg, that left leg, so much with his kicks. Like, 90% of his kicks come from that left leg. It's his power kick. It's his range judging kick. It's his setup kick. It's everything for him. So if Adesanya could definitely shoot that leg up. And let's, let's say nothing. Like, we talk about Adesanya losing by knockout one time in his career in kickboxing, not even MMA. But Vahovic has lost to a counterpunch from a middleweight before in recent years, what, two years ago, more recent. Like, Adesanya lost four years ago in kickboxing. But Vahovic lost in the octagon two years ago to a middleweight that's on the same card. And also, you look at it, he lost to Sokoju because he got his leg kicked and he got injured off of that. So he lost the leg kick, which Adesanya is good at. So he lost the kick to what Adesanya is good at. And he lost the counterpunch with what Adesanya is even better at than the guy who knocked him out. So let's talk about Blahovic getting knocked out. Let's talk about Blahovic's chin. But that's not even besides the point. What I was thinking, I think Adesanya is a cleaner striker. I think he's addressing and grappling. And with the speed advantage, Adesanya's takedown defense relies heavily on him pre-planning his takedown defense. Like even when he said about Brunson, he um plans his takedown defense like two steps ahead. Now you'll be four steps ahead, ahead against an even slower fighter. And even a guy that's not a wrestler. So he'll be even more ahead of like ahead on Belhovitz because of that speed advantage to set up his hooks before Belhovitz even thinks about the takedown if he needs to use that. Then on the field, I think his movement's going to be an issue. I think his stance's going to be an issue. And his arsenal's going to be an issue. I think Belhovitz doesn't really move his head the best, so he should be able to catch him with a jab all day. And switch those stances up, land kicks to the body, chew up that left leg heavily, move left, move right. Switch up and land kicks to the leg and really just keep walking Blahovitz into the strikes, feign him, throw him off, counter, angle, and really just bust up Blahovitz and, you know, use his aggression against him, start to wear him down, like bludgeon, I mean, bust his eyes up, bust his nose up, bust his mouth up, and then start to have him breathe heavy, dig him to the body. And then I think in that third, third round, he's going to have him really dead to rights, and that fourth round, he's going to put him out. So in this one, I have Israel Adesanya via fourth round TKO. And that concludes my fight predictions for the, the full card of UFC 259, Blahovitz versus Adesanya. And as always, thanks for watching.